So welcome everyone to our impressive farmer webinar, Trees and Bees, Friends with Benefits. This webinar is part of our educational series designed to share with our world tree farmers and the broader community best practices for growing Empress Splendor trees and other similar crops and to introduce different aspects of regenerative agricultural practices. And this program is being developed as part of World Tree's mission to elevate, educate, and innovate for our planet. So my name is Rita Fromholt, and I'm responsible for our farmer marketing program and other special projects here at World Tree. And we also have with us today Andy Norris, who is World Tree's head of US Forestry and Farms. Andrew, did you want to introduce yourself? I think Andy has dropped off, so we'll wait for Andy to come back on. Uh, well, we know many of our farmers are very interested in learning about how to raise and support bee populations on their land, along with their trees and other crops as well. So not only is this good for the environment, uh, it's also potentially another stream of income from the production of honey and possibly beeswax if things go well. So we're very excited to be hosting this webinar tonight with our special guest, uh, Jimmy Gatt. Jimmy is a journeyman beekeeper and he's vice president of the Metro Atlanta Beekeepers Association. He enjoys public speaking to beekeeping, gardening and civic groups on the subject of beekeeping, high impact bee friendly horticulture and regenerative agriculture. And he also works uh, his day job as a software developer and he lives in Marietta, Georgia. Jimmy also has a special love of trees and is a regular volunteer with the nonprofit group Trees Atlanta. So Jimmy's going to walk us through his presentation, which will be about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll have some time to answer your questions. So please post your questions in the bottom. If you mouse over, you'll see a box that says Q&A. Uh, just post your question in there, and I'll keep an eye on those, and we'll address those at the end once uh, Jimmy has finished. So thank you, everyone, and I'll turn it over to Jimmy. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. I will go ahead and share my screen. All right. Thank you again, everyone, for joining me. And I'm going to give you a overview of what beekeeping can be for you. I'm going to touch on a lot of different subjects, but I'm not going to go too deeply into them because beekeeping is a really, really big subject. So if that's why it seems a little bit light, that's why. So. The outline, we will talk about polonia honey. We'll talk about different income streams that you can realize from keeping honeybees. We'll talk about the work involved in a year of beekeeping. We'll discuss some of the challenges that you can face in keeping honeybees. We'll talk about what you can plant for your honeybees and how you can take the next steps if you're ready to begin. And I'll close out by telling you why I love honeybees. So first, Polonia honey. So here's an image of Patricia Doyle of Wait and See Farm in Westchester, Pennsylvania, and she is extracting bottles of Polonia honey, and that's the color of it right there. Isn't it gorgeous? Polonia honey has been consumed in Asia for hundreds of years, but it, and it's said to have a very remarkable taste. It's a light and very aromatic honey. That's one quote I found about it. Polonia honey is gonna be a rare treat and going to be entirely new to most Americans. So with a large enough plot of Polonia trees, you can expect what we call a monofloral honey from your Polonia trees and be able to produce something that's gonna really blow people away. So how much honey can you expect from your Polonia trees? Well, one source I found says that you can expect about 1,000 to 1,200 pounds of polonia honey per acre that you've got planted. And if we compare that to some other high yield honey trees, black locusts will give 800 to 1,200 pounds per acre. And basswood will give about 800 to 1,100 pounds per acre. So in other words, Polonia is very competitive with some of our top producing honey trees in the United States. So how much is that worth? Well, at the high end, because I sell my honey for 16 bucks a pound, 1,200 pounds of Polonia honey per acre would be $25,600 in income per year per acre in honey alone. So that would be a good time to talk about 
all of the income streams that you could realize from your honeybees. Of course, we just talked about selling honey. And here is some honey from one of my friends in Atlanta and how he packages it. But you can also sell beeswax that you can render from your hives. And beeswax is an entirely natural product and it can be made into really beautiful beeswax candles that people love to buy. You can also sell something called propolis. Propolis is tree resin that the bees collect from trees and then they use it to seal up the hive. And this is probably the single most valuable thing that you can sell from your beehive, provided that you can find an actual buyer for it. Propolis is used medicinally in every single country in the world except for ours. You can also sell bees. And I know more than a few beekeepers who realize this is their primary income stream because as more and more people become beekeepers, more and more people need to buy bees. What this man is holding is called a package of bees and a three pound package of bees can sell for up to $180 a piece. And you can also make and sell mead. And I'm definitely not going to this topic um, that is an entirely different presentation. And then trying to navigate the liquor laws is a couple of more presentations after that. So let's move on. So how do you sell honey once you've actually harvested it? Well, in Georgia, and I live in Georgia, so I can speak confidently about this. You have the right to sell your own honey from your house, your own business and online, like on Facebook or Etsy, et cetera. And this is what, what I do is I can just sell honey. I don't need any other licenses like that. However, if you want to sell from someone else's store, like if you wanna put your honey in Costco or Publix, that's an entirely different matter because then you must acquire a food sales establishment license and you also must have a USDA certified honey house. So keep that in mind if you're going to be producing honey and you're gonna to have to check with your own state's guidelines for what you need to do if you wanna sell in third party retail, wholesale or bulk honey sales. So let's talk a bit about the work that you can expect to have in a year of beekeeping. So how difficult is it to keep bees? I get this question a lot. Well, let me give you two perspectives on this and I'll do this based in two quotes that I've heard. So the first one, keeping bees is harder than keeping a cat, but it's easier than keeping a dog. And here's another perspective. I can teach someone everything about raising cattle in a week, and it would take me the rest of my life to teach someone everything about keeping bees. In other words, it's not necessarily that difficult to keep bees, but there is a lot to learn about it. So what can you expect in a year of beekeeping? In winter, pretty much nothing. And you can expect that some of your colonies will die. About 20% to 50% colony loss per year is normal for all beekeepers. So winter, I think, is a good time to build and paint more bee boxes. So once we get into spring, this is definitely the busiest time of the year in beekeeping. This is when you're gonna be in your hives most of the time. This is when you start splitting. That's how you make more colonies. This is when your colonies will start swarming. This is the natural way that honeybees reproduce when they do. Half of the colony flies away with all the honey. And so this is also when you're gonna go through efforts to start implementing these swarm prevention techniques because if your bees don't swarm, you're not gonna lose that honey. And this is also the time most likely that you're gonna start harvesting the honey. And that means you're gonna rob the hives, you're going to extract the honey from the frames and then you're gonna bottle it up. So this is why I told my family, no more vacations in March, April, or May, because I am generally in my beehives every single weekend in spring. So then once you get into summer, is this is when your colonies are going to be at their most populous and they're going to be hungry. However, this is also the time of year that very much of us in the Eastern United States are gonna have very few blooming plants that are given nectar and we call this the summer dearth. This is when your stronger colonies will start robbing your weaker colonies. And it's generally a hot and miserable time to work your bees. 
And then once we get into autumn is we get a reprieve from the summer dearth because wild goldenrod and fall blooming asters will start giving nectar and that makes your hives a lot easier to work. And a lot of people, a lot of beekeepers make some late splits this time of year and make some what we call nukes to overwinter and basically have more bees to go into next year. So again, most of the work is gonna be in the spring. And in autumn, that's when you prepare your colonies for the winter. So about how many hours in a week? Well, during spring in the busiest time, I would say it really depends on your goals, how many colonies you have and what you're trying to achieve. It's really hard to answer that question, but I can process about 10 frames of honey in about three hours, which would be about 30 pounds of honey. And this is what some of that processing looks like, some really nice comb honey right there. And that's gonna be frame to labeled jar time. But keep in mind that when I'm doing this, I'm working alone and I'm using manual tools. God, look at that honey, isn't that amazing? And you can always do a lot more work if you have more employees, if you have family helping you, or if you start involving mechanization. And once you get up into the hundreds of hives level, then you're gonna start buying equipment that looks more like this, that's going to do this heavy work of extraction for you and make that a lot easier. This is a question I get a lot. How much money does it cost to get started beekeeping? Well, how much does it cost to build a house? You know, the answer there, of course, it depends. But I can give you some ideas of how much it can cost. So we have the high cost and the least effort option. And that would be you can buy a complete hive kit that's already painted. And here's one from Man Lake. It's $341.30 for that four box hive. If you wanna save some money, but put some more effort into it, the medium cost, medium effort would be buying these unassembled hive components that look like this. Everything's already cut. You just have to put it together. You have to glue it together. You nail it together and then you paint it. And this is what most beekeepers do that I know. If you want to go through the lowest cost option, then you can go find some scrap wood from a dumpster and you can build a hive that looks like this. This is called the top bar hive. And if you can find free lumber and build an easy hive, then you can do this really on the cheap. So since I mentioned a top bar hive, it might be a good time now to talk about different hive types. So the Langstroth hive is the most common hive in the USA. And it looks like this. It's a vertically stacking hive. And the reason why this is most common is because it's really good for migratory beekeeping. The largest beekeepers in the United States are not keeping bees for honey, they're keeping bees for pollination. So they stack their Langstroth hives on the back of a flatbed truck. This is why the boxes are all square. It's why they all have recessed handles so they can sit flush on the back of a flatbed truck. And they drive their bees around to different crops for pollination. So the top bar hive that I mentioned earlier looks more like this. And it is called the top bar hive because the bees are not actually in a frame. Instead, it's just a single bar and the bees build the comb underneath it. The top bar hives are the cheapest and easiest hives to build. I mean, I can show you this design and if any of you are a woodworker, you can see just how easily that goes together and how easy those cuts are to make. Another option is horizontal hives. And this one is called the Layens hive. These hives are very popular in Europe and in Russia. It's kind of like the Langstroth hive, except it grows this way instead of upwards and they have really, really tall frames and they're really good for stationary beekeeping. So if you aren't ever planning on moving your hives, then I think this hive is better suited for you, especially since you're never having to lift the heavy box off the top of the hive, which can injure your back. And keep in mind, polonia lumber is excellent material for, for building beehives. It is light, it is strong, and it's got a greater R value than pine, which is what most beehives are made out of. So now we'll talk about some of the challenges that you're gonna face in keeping honeybees. 
And we generally like to summarize these with what we call the four Ps, which are pests, pathogens, pesticides, and poor nutrition. And any one of these four can kill your bees. And you may have to cope with more than one of these at a time. So pests, we have to mention the horrible Varroa mite, Varroa destructor. On this honeybee, it's this ruddy red mite that happens to be on that bee. It is by far the most serious and deadly pest that beekeepers are facing. The Varroa mite comes from Asia and evolved with a different species of honeybee, Apis serrana, but Apis mellifera, which is our honeybees, have no defense against this horrible mite. Every beekeeper has to cope with this mite. Another pest that comes from Africa is the small hive beetle, Ethina tumita. Here's a whole bunch of them and what they look like. They're smaller than the honeybees. The honeybees cannot sting them. You will definitely see these in the hive. Is This can either be a nuisance or a pest. Lots of beekeepers are gonna open a hive and see a few, few, few uh, small hive beetles and squish them with their hive tool. But if the number of small hive beetles gets too high, it can make your bees abscond, which means the bees say, this is a dump, I'm out of here and they leave. And then we have wax moths. And this is what a wax moth infestation looks like on a, a bee frame. Wax moths are what we call a secondary pest because they don't actually kill hives. They actually invade hives that are already dead. But lots of beekeepers are gonna open their hives and see this mess and think that their hives were killed by wax moths. If we mention pathogens, a very serious one is deformed wing virus. And this is what a bee who's suffering from deformed wing virus looks like. She will never fly. Um, deformed wing virus is vectored by the varroa mite. The ve varroa mite vectors a number of different viruses. Next, we'll talk about European fowl brood. This is kind of what it looks like. Instead of the pearly white larva in the cells, you're gonna see these discolored brown and black colored larva. And European fowl brood is somewhat common. It doesn't always kill hives and it is treatable. But a more serious one would be American fowl brood. And this is what we call the rope test, is when this happens to your hive, your hive is an absolute goner because one spore is enough to kill many, many, many beehives. So this is why when a hive is detected with American fowl brood, the treatment for this is to burn it because those spores are very deadly. Thankfully, American fowl brood is something that we don't see very often anymore. So pesticides, there are simply too many to list here. There's just too many to go into much detail, but there's a couple I wanna highlight. Pesticides like carbamates include seven. And this one is of particular interest to honeybees because it's used in apple orchards. This is an apple blossom and apples always bloom like this with the single biggest bloom in the center called the king apple. And that's the only apple that most apple orchardists want to keep. So apple orchardists will oftentimes hire a migratory beekeeper to come and pollinate their apple trees. And when they're done, they will spray all of the trees with seven. Not because they're trying to poison anything, but seven has the side effect of causing those five other non-king apple blooms to fall off. So if your stand and your bees is next to an apple orchard, your bees could forage from those apple trees after they've been treated with seven and bring back that contaminated pollen back to the hive and kill the entire colony. We can talk about organophosphates a little bit. And if you grew up or live in Florida, this will be a familiar sight to you. This of course is an airplane spraying malathion. 
organophosphates used to be a lot more popular, but are going out of favor because of their negative impacts on fish and mammal life. Instead, they've been replaced by neonicotinoids, which are right now the most common insecticides that are in use by the agricultural industry. These are systemic and very common in monocrops like cotton. And these have been banned in many European countries, but neonicotinoids are still in use in the United States because of insane pressure by the agrochemical industry. Neonicotinoids are not immediately fatal to honeybees, but they are responsible for what many people believe is to be damaging the bee's ability to actually find their way back home. So if your, tree, if your stand of trees and your honeybees is next to a very large monocrop like cotton, then there's a good chance that your honeybees could end up with neonicotinoids in their system as well. And last, poor nutrition. So if the beekeeper robs all of the spring honey, then their bees can actually starve in summer. If you remember from earlier, we call that the summer dearth. And that's when very, very few things are blooming. So what many beekeepers choose to do is feed their honeybees sugar syrup if the bees have inadequate forage. And here is a beekeeper doing exactly that. He's not actually pouring the sugar syrup directly into the, fry, into the hive on top of the frames. There's actually gonna be a, a feeder in there that you cannot see and he's pouring the sugar syrup into the feeder. And so if your stand just happens to be in South Georgia, then you might have nothing but pine forests all around you, something that looks like this. And I lived in South Georgia for a while, so I remember seeing this everywhere. And I believe that's Kogon grass, which is an invasive uh, grass that's growing around it. So if you've got nothing but this all around you, then your polonia trees and whatever else you plant might be the only thing that's feeding your bees. And when that polonia nectar is gone, then your bees might have nothing left to eat. So I, it should go without saying that your bees eating their own honey is gonna be much better for their health than eating sugar syrup. So what if you do have those stands of pine trees all around you? Can you plant something for your honey bees that can actually improve their lot in life? Absolutely. And so, Keep in mind that all beekeeping is very local. There's gonna be wide variations in plants at the local level. So if you're in the Appalachian Mountains, then that's gonna be especially true because the bottom of the holler can have a very different climate from the top of the holler. Honeybees will forage for up to two miles away from the hive. That's why a plant of cotton next to your property can be seriously bad. And the honeybees can forage up to six miles, but they're gonna dramatically lose their effectiveness outside of two miles. So I'm gonna highlight a few plants that can be intercropped with polonia, but what you plant is gonna be dependent on what's gonna be good for your region. And whatever you choose to plant, keep in mind that planting more of it is gonna be better than less because that's what it makes it more attractive to your honeybees. So first, let's talk about clover. This one is white clover, Trifolium ripens. Pros is that white clover is very easy to grow. It's very inexpensive to buy seed. White clover is nitrogen fixing, just like the polonia tree, and it's also very low effort to grow. Some of the cons would be that it's mostly gonna be spring blooming. And remember, you need those summer blooming plants to actually round out the year. And it's not gonna do a good job at out-competing weeds. I've got lots of it in my backyard, but it's not really winning right now. Next, I'd love to highlight sumac. And this is smooth sumac, Rus glabra not related to poison sumac. You're not gonna see poison sumac, it grows in swamps, unless you live in a swamp. So the pros of sumac is that it's gonna be tolerant of poor soil, it's gonna be tolerant of drought, super easy to grow. It's gonna bloom in the summer, right when your bees really, really need it, and it's gonna make a very high quality honey that people crave. 
The cons is that this is going to be a much larger plant. You know, it can get to be as big as 15 feet by 15 feet, and also it's going to be colonizing. So it's going to spread from one place to another. Another suburb blooming plant would be buckwheat. So a really good pro for this is that this plant actually will smother weeds and do a good job of it. It blooms in summer, then it's going to reseed and it's going to bloom again. And you can chop and drop this plant to increase the nitrogen levels in the soil. I've heard some people say you can plow it under, but I believe in regenerative agriculture and I say do not plow, please. The con is that the honey that this makes is very dark, very strong, and to some people it's rather unpleasant. Another that I'd highlight would be anise hyssop. So the pro of this plant is that it will start blooming in July and it will bloom consistently all the way until first frost and just make huge nectar yields from such a small plant. And the con, just like clover, is that this plant will not smother weeds. It's gonna be more expensive than clover to plant. And this is another colonizing plant. So a little bit harder to control. And last, common milkweed, Asclepia syriaca. Uh, the pro of this plant is that it's highly nectiferous for such a small plant, and it's also the host plant for the monarch butterfly. So we're not just planting for bees, remember. You can also plant things for you know, our poor butterflies who are in much worse shape than our bees. And the con, of course, is that it's going to be eaten by the monarch butterfly, and that may be inimical to what you're trying to do. And this plant is also colonizing, will grow and sprout up. So I hope that gives you some ideas of some of the things you could possibly intercrop with your polonia trees. So how do we take the next steps? The first few years of beekeeping are by far the most difficult that you're gonna face because trying to absorb all of the information that you're going to hear about is kind of like drinking from a fire hose. Every beekeeper has their own opinions and their own style on how to keep bees. So I believe it's your job as a new beekeeper is to find your own style of beekeeping. And so ask yourself questions like these. Do you want to maximize your honey harvest? Do you want to sell bees? Do you want to be a chemical free beekeeper? The answer to these questions and many more is going to determine what your style of beekeeping is. So the most important next step that I think you should take is to join a local bee club. And I'm going to provide a list of local bee clubs to World Tree, and that list will come to you in a follow-up email. So once you get into your local bee club, I highly suggest that you find a mentor, somebody you can ask lots and lots of questions to. And keep in mind that your mentor is gonna have their own personal style of beekeeping. So what works for them won't necessarily work for you. And if you are a woodworker, then it's a good time to look up plans for building beehives. And Leo Sharashkin provides free detailed plans for building horizontal hives on his website. And that will be included in your email as well. I do have some recommended reading for you, but keep in mind, there is absolutely no substitute for hands-on learning. There's nothing like getting your hands on the bees and actually seeing what they do. That's how you learn the best. And after all, honeybees don't read beekeeping books. But something I can recommend, there is a quarterly magazine from Bee Culture. It's called Beekeeping, Your First Three Years. And they came out with this magazine a few years ago because there's just been a huge influx and in interest in beekeeping and they realized there needed to be this resource for all these new beekeepers. Another book I would highly recommend that's going to be of great interest to you is Plants Honeybees Use in the Ohio and Tennessee Valleys. That sounds really regionally very specific, but the plants mentioned in this book are actually going to work almost anywhere east of the Mississippi and East Texas pretty much any of those regions except for maybe the very south tip of Florida and maybe the upper tip of Maine. This is a book written by a beekeeper for beekeepers talking about what plants are common, what plants are invasive, what plants are nectiferous. 
And the last book I would recommend is called Honey from the Earth. This book took 15 years of research to make. It has some of the most beautiful full color photographs of honeybees and how they are kept in many, many, many different places all over the world. And so that's going to give you an idea of what beekeeping can be and is to many other people. So why do I love honeybees? Photographing honeybees is beautiful is when everything is blooming in spring and getting up close and seeing them work, that's nature's communion right there. One of my most favorite things to take a picture of, except maybe mushrooms. And teaching beekeeping is wonderful. This is me and my nephew, Braden, and he was in second grade when I got him into my beehive for the first time. And then he promptly drew this little picture of himself in a bee suit saying, hi bee, and a picture of the beehive. Observing the bees is spellbinding. Opening up the hive and smelling the smell of the beeswax and the honey, that warm, inviting smell, and just hearing that hum and watching them do a bee dance and watching a bee emerging from the cell, finding the queen and feeling excited. It is, there's just nothing like that. It's electrifying. And of course, harvesting honey is absolutely amazing just when you see that huge waterfall of honey coming out of the extractor and it just absolutely fills the kitchen with the smell of raw honey. There's just nothing like it. So to put it short, becoming a beekeeper is life-changing in so many good ways. I've touched on everything. I say thank you and now I'll be happy to take your questions. Wow, Jimmy, that was amazing. Your your passion for bees uh, shines bright and true through all of that. And that was just a wealth of information. Yes. And boy, um, it's complicated, isn't it? And I think it's, uh, from what I could tell, it's as much of a an art as a science. Um, oh, yes. And to be good at it, there has to be some love in there too, uh, and compassion because uh, the bees, I think the bees know that. So welcome, Andy. We missed you at the beginning. Andy Norris, who's head of US Forestry and Farms for World Tree, is joining us. Hello, everybody. Um, hi. So as um, Jimmy reminded us, if you have questions, if you could post them in the Q&A at the bottom. So just mouse over the bottom of your screen and click on that button and put it in there. And I will watch for your questions. Um, Andy, did you have any questions or anything you wanted to add right now? I just wanted to, to say that um, one of the things that that makes this this so so special is that for for folks growing polonia, the the time when you spend the most your most effort is in the first zero, one, two, three years. And then, uh, and then things slow down, and it just so happens that after that third year is typically when you start seeing polonia starting to to break bud and and having these flowers. And so, fortunately, uh, you guys won't be necessarily faced with with the the task of of taking care of the polonia trees in earnest and doing the beehives. Uh, because because one follows the other, kind of. So I, I think it's a, it's a perfect union there. Indeed, and and further down the road, um, you know, we're hearing more and more what that this relationship between the Empress Polonia trees and bees goes into the beehive making as well. As you mentioned, Jimmy, that the wood um, it's super light, super strong, doesn't rot, and has the very high R factor. So it helps keeps the bees cool in the summer and warm in the winter and you can move move them around easily you know throughout the season when you've got to move your hives around so that's that's a major plus that's something exciting I think um, uh, we'll definitely be targeting uh, with when we have some some more lumber uh, we'll be going after the beekeepers and uh, yes yeah, so we have a, a question from Lori um, 
I've seen promos for beehives that have built-in extractors that pull the honey directly from the hive into a spout that pours into bottles. How do you feel about those? I think that's the flow hive she's probably referring to, Lori. Yeah. Indeed, this is, yeah. this is the flow hive. It's probably one of the most successful promotions ever done. It received a massive amount of interest and a lot of curmudgeon kvetching from some old beekeepers who didn't like all these upstart people asking them about the flow hive all the time. Um, I think the flow hive is fine. It's got pros and cons. One of the, the biggest con is that it's expensive. And if you want to have a flow hive on top of every single one of your Langstroth hives, that's 600 bucks a pop. So um, that being said, the way it works is it has these plastic frames that have cells in them and when you turn the lever is the cell will turn like this and so it will then from turn from a container of honey into a channel of honey and so the honey just simply flows out out of the bottom right. what this does is it makes the job of extraction easier and as long as the honey doesn't crystallize then i think it will work just fine but yes i think they're expensive they're expensive mm -hmm. is that we said yeah but is it easier on the hive then if you have to have less direct contact with the bees? Yes, anytime you go into the hive and you're going to inadvertently kill some bees, this is just a, a fact of beekeeping. And so mm -hmm. I do think this, that this is a much less invasive form yeah. of harvesting and that is a good thing. Right, right. Um, yeah, I, I have another question about We've, we've focused on uh, honey production and, and raising honey bees, but what about native bees? Um, will planting trees and polonia empress trees um, help the native bees as well, if you think about that? Planting anything that gives nectar is going to be good for nectar eating insects. So mm -hmm. yes, our native bees do consume nectar and they will absolutely be harvesting from your polonia trees. Right. And I like the way you um, you gave us some good ideas on cover crops. Um, you know, it, it, we've we've had another webinar on that. But if we focus on the cover crops that are good for not only you know keeping the soil down and good for healthy soil, but also for um, for bees, um, you could have a pretty good regenerative agriculture um, example going on your property, which is which is an exciting thing. Um, so Lori had a follow-up question about, about the flow highs. Um, do you have to go in and clean the frames or do you just, do, do you just attract, extract the honey each season? I wouldn't say you extract honey each season because the bees could very conceivably fill up the entire flow hive and then want to put even more honey in it and have no more room to put it. So this is actually one of the benefits of it is if they are harvesting more than you can actually handle, it's much easier to extract it and allow them to store even more. You will never have to clean these. You never have to tell a honey bee to clean honey out of a hive. They will take care of that for you. They know how to do it in natural. Natural setting, right? Um, That's right. How many seasons does the Polonia produce flowers? Do you wanna answer that, Andy? Go ahead, Andy. You're on mute, Andy. There we go. Yes. So, so we, um, Polonia has different strains and um, for the most part, we've found that the the tree will start producing blooms if they're growing really well, possibly the third year, and then and then going forth uh, every year after that. Um, we uh, our duration that we're that we're working with our farmers that are growing polonia is an eight to uh, twelve year period, and so uh, we look to. Um, to expect those those blooms from say let's just be conservative year four through year year ten, and it it does bring up a good question though is what what do you do at that tenth year if if you've been um, you know if you've been counting on the, the polonia for for the uh, nectar and you you do have to factor that in in that either you you reducing your your hives very much so anticipating that harvest, you know, at year 10, 
uh, or or you have enough other plants around that you, you think that they can migrate to for, for their nectar. Um, now, polonia will continue to grow, you know, right on after 10, 10 years. It's just our model is, is it's harvested at year 10 and then it quickly grows back. That's, that's one of the beauties of polonia. It re-sprouts from the stump and it grows back uh, up to six more times after that that um, initial harvest. So, so after you, you would harvest, you'd see maybe another two, three years as it's growing up again, and then, then you have some more blooms again. So you'll have like a period of three, three years or so between um, uh, polonia uh, flowering for, for nectar. So I hope that answered your question. Great. And Teresa is asking if uh, this is being recorded, and it most definitely is. Uh, we will have the recording um, up on our website along with the summary blog that I'll create, and that will live there forever. So you'll be able to replay it anytime you want. It was a lot of information given for sure. Um, I know I took a few notes while you were speaking to me, but I, I didn't get everything down. Something definitely to review, and we'll also include more information in the follow-up email that we'll send to everyone who registered for this webinar. It, it's kind of like what Jimmy said. It's it's uh, trying to drink from a fire hydrant. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, and I'm sure there was so much more you could have said about all those different topics than you did, but you gave us a really good overview. Yeah, I have another question. While we're waiting for for people to to think about some other questions for you. Um, now you said that 30 to 50% colony loss every winter is normal. That is normal. And it in fact, is, some okay. beekeepers will have even, uh, even more loss. And that depends on a lot of factors. Um, a lot of those hives could starve to death if beekeepers, if they eat all their honey and the beekeepers don't check and realize that they're out of food, then yeah, the bees will starve. Um, a lot of them are going to die from varroa related diseases. Like I said, the varroa mite is the number one problem in beekeeping right now. Um, a, lot of, a lot of hives will be killed by pesticides. And that happens when you walk out to your hive and see just a huge pile of dead bees right in front of your hive. You know, that's a pesticide kill. So all of these things are, are facing beekeepers right now. It's really tough on beekeepers when they start with two hives and then both hives die that year and they feel like, oh no, I'm a failure. And this mm -hmm. is why I say a good beekeeper is not a beekeeper that has a record of honey harvest every year or whose hives never swarm. That's not a good beekeeper to me. A good beekeeper is one who can still feel that sense of wonder and joy, even in the face of all of the challenges that they face in beekeeping. Right. One of the things I read uh, when I was doing my own research on this is people are worried that, you know, colony collapse is becoming different types, as you said, is becoming more and more common because of all these threats that it's putting some people off of beekeeping. And that could also accelerate the decline of the number of bees that we have is that people are getting discouraged. But, you know, what you say is wise that you just you just keep trying. You, you anticipate some losses, mm -hmm. but that's not a reason to not keep trying. Uh, Laura has another good question here. Do honey companies pay landowners to put their bees on it? The big honey companies, I guess you're asking about, or, or other producers in your area? Depends on the honey company. Is There are some honey companies that actually contract with different beekeepers to produce honey, and most of those largest honey producers are, in fact, migratory beekeepers. Um, the beekeepers who are taking their hives around to not only pollinate different crops, but also to capture some of that nectar flow when it's happening. Um, mm -hmm. Clover is a huge example of that. Um, so in that, to answer that question, yes, because generally they're putting their hives on that property to pollinate the crop and the honey is a byproduct of the pollination. Right, it's fascinating those those trucks full of beehives that go around from from farm to farm. Um, does that uh, does that disturb the bees at all when they're being moved like that? Yes, it does. Yeah, I think. So Georgianne is asking. So if there's fifty percent plus loss every winter, how are the hives replenished? Do you just have to Good keep question. buying new bees? I guess. 
well, then the people who are selling the bees would also have that same loss. So how are they doing it? Is mm -hmm. This is when I mentioned splitting. And splitting is the act of taking a hive and making two hives out of it. Simply, now you've got two boxes that are smaller. Each one half is small, and one of them has a queen, and one of them doesn't. And the one that doesn't have a queen will raise a new queen. So now you have two colonies. This is called mm -hmm. making a split, but there are more sophisticated ways of doing that. And that is when you get into what beekeepers call queen rearing. And that's where you get a hive to make 50 queens. And then you put the queen cells mm. into an incubator and you hatch the queens. And then you have those queens mate in the mating nuke. And then you put them into a little bitty baby nuke. And so now you have a little bitty nuke with a brand new queen in it. And that's how you can make a whole bunch of hives all at once. Someone with practice. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, indeed. So Mike's asking, how many hives do you have and what kind of bees do you have? Um, right now, I have three hives. I've had as many as six. It's more complex for me because I can't keep bees on my own property. So that means mm -hmm. I have to um, work with other people to keep my bees on their property. And what kind of bees do I have? Um, I'd say they're mutts. Um, I know one of them was a rescue from a, a be removal from a house and I've split that a couple of times. And each time they make a new queen is that queen is going to mate with drones from many other hives. And so you get a very mix of genetics. Okay. And Laura's got a question for us. What's the address to see the previous videos, educational videos? Um, I'm gonna go back and watch them. Go to our news page uh, on our website. That's where our blogs are. And the blogs um, are attached to the video recordings of the other, the first two. And we'll be putting the, the cover crop one up uh, maybe tomorrow or Friday. That was the one we had before. And then we'll get this one up next week sometime. So I'm on the lookout for that. We're also going to make another special section for, for these on the website. I'm just working with the, uh, the web developer right now. Best place to put them. So Dan's asking, should you plant polonia trees in increment years, such as some every, every other years? Is that more of a, a farming question? What do you think, Andy? Right, I, I saw that one. Um, and you, you're onto something there, you know, that, that makes sense intuitively. That way, you know, you, you have staggered, um, a, a staggered situation where you're, you're always gonna have some blooms. Um, the thing about polonia trees, though, is um, you're, you're not going to find them just at any nursery um, in small numbers to just kind of experiment with. Um, it's um, if you work through us, World Tree, we we will help you get those. We'll actually provide the trees, but we need you to be planting ten acres or more in, in order to for us to you know, work with you on it. Now, I, I could say, yes, there are few, if you go on the internet, you can find some, um, some companies that sell you know, small numbers of, of polonia trees there. there and and that is, um, that's something you could try, definitely. But we do have some of our farmers that are planting 10 acres every year, right? And people that have right. larger properties and staggering that way, even, even in the size, the minimum size that, that we require. And that's a good way, yeah, to keep it rolling over all the time. So you never have a, a year where there were no trees at all. Uh, Lori's got another question. We have three beehives and have cleaned the frames. And when we harvest the honey and the entire beehive, when we lose, a hive, one, lose a hive, one. Is this necessary? Number two, if so, do you have to do that with the flow of the hive as well? Does that make sense to you? Um, a, a bit, it depends on what you mean by clean, is when after I harvest a frame of honey, if I'm using the extractor, then what I'm gonna end up is a, uh, a frame of comb that has most of the honey removed is what I'll do is I'll just set that outside and honeybees will find it. And so they will clean it by removing all the rest of the honey that's in there. And so it will just be beeswax after that. That's what I do. Um, but 
I don't do any other cleaning after that. Um, if a hive dies, if there's if there's wax moth cocoons in there, then I will definitely scrape those out because those damage the woodenware. Mm -hmm. But I don't do any more cleaning after that. If the hives, if the frames, if the comb has mold on it, I don't clean that off. The bees will clean that off for me. So um, I, I do very little cleaning. Um, and do you have to do that with the flow hive? I don't think so. Yeah, it seemed like it was self-cleaning. Rita, yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's another question on the chat. Not sure if you saw from Juan Lopez. I did not. Uh, so Juan is asking, when is the best time to treat beehives for larvae and for beetles? And what product is best to use? That's a That would take a long time to answer that. I wouldn't say any one of them is best as they all have pros and cons and you have to decide which one works best for you. There is a site called the Bee Informed Partnership that actually gives you a tool that you can use to answer a few questions. And that's going to help guide you to what the optimal treatment for varroa mites will be at any given time mm -hmm. of the year. That's gonna depend on if you have supers on, it depends on what the temperature is. And for beetles, the best thing to do for small hive beetles is to have your hives in full sun because that helps mm -hmm. repel the beetles. Um, if you can't do that, there's a couple of other products that you can use. There's one called the Guardian uh, Beetle Entrance Protector, and it's basically this red plastic thing that goes on the front of the beehive, and the bees cannot see red, but the beetles can, and so the beetles will congregate underneath the entrance and can't get in there. And that's what I'm experimenting in my bee club with different beekeepers trying to see if it works, because it's cheap and it's simple. I heard that a honeybee's favorite color is blue. Is that true? Uh, I cannot confirm or deny. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how anyone would know that, but um, Georgian's question. So if a bee is a mutt, are the resulting hives stronger in resisting pests? This is a fascinating question is there are lots of people right now who are deeply involved in trying to breed a better bee that's going to have the genetic resistance against yeah. pests because lots of people don't want to put chemicals in their hives and instead they would rather have a stronger bee that can resist the pests themselves. Mm -hmm. um, the answer to that is a very qualified yes. Um, I know a beekeeper who raises his own queens. And when he treats for mites, we'll see dozens drop. And then he buys commercial queens from a queen breeder. And when he treats those hives for mites, he sees hundreds of mites drop. So his experience is that his local grown bees have much fewer mites than the commercial ones that come from another state. Well, again, the complexity is uh, quite mind boggling. Um, just going to the chat then, um, Dan has a question maybe uh, for Andy as well. Should you plant polonia trees in rental yeats? Uh, probably he, years. He, um, he um, corrected rate? that to incremental. Rental so. years, okay, yeah. Maybe so a different number that. every other year, yeah, possible. So we, we and uh, Juan has another question. Uh, uh, we, we answered, answered Juan's that. question. We did. We answered Juan's question. So if anyone else has any questions, you want to put them in the Q&A. Uh, Lori has just posted another one. What would be the ideal cover crop that feeds the bees to prevent weed growth? You've listed a number. Um, what's your preference? Best overall? Definitely for preventing weed growth is I would go with buckwheat. That's sort well, of the strongest, biggest one, wasn't that it? The was one that had the strong it's, honey. It has the, the strong honey. Is There's people who think that, it, that, I mean, I love strong honey. I love strong flavors. So I'm, I'm all over that. Buckwheat honey is traditional in Southern France. There's lots of French pastry recipes that absolutely require the use of buckwheat honey to make them taste authentic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've bought it before. I thought it was great. I like the variety. You know, it'd be very different than Polonial, as you were saying, which is which is very light, but mm -hmm. it's nice to have have variety. Um, all right. So 
Uh, we have a few minutes left if anyone has any other questions. Had some good ones. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Do you have anything you'd like to add then in closing, Jimmy? I want to thank you all for joining and I highly encourage you to look into honeybees because it's been life changing for me. It's introduced me to so many interesting people and I absolutely love the bees. And I say this even having been stung many times and sent to the hospital with anaphylaxis and I still love bees. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised there wasn't a question about stinging, but, but that's, uh, that's good to hear. Actually, I have an interesting anecdote about that. I read on the uh, Alabama Beekeepers Association newsletter that they did a study of beekeepers in China in Wuhan province of like 5,700 of them, you know, who'd been stung multiple times. Not a single one of them uh, got COVID. Um, even after, you know, some of them were in the cities and were directly exposed to the virus from family members and other close contacts and not a single one got COVID. So it seems wow. there's more to study there about the immunity of being stung a lot might actually help you in fighting some of these coronaviruses, which is a pretty interesting thing. Think about nature has the cure all the time somewhere. What, what you're describing is called apitherapy and... Uh -huh. And selling venom is actually an income stream for honeybees, but it is not something that I recommend simply because I don't see, think there is any conclusive scientific evidence yeah. yet on yeah. the efficacy of apitherapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, what the study was saying was like, hmm, this is interesting. Um, somebody should really look into this and with the scientific method and see what there is to it. But anecdotally, it looked like there was definitely something there. Very interesting. Uh, we have another okay. question from George Ann. Okay. Uh, she there. asks, but if your peas, if your bees have polonia flowers and then buckwheat for food, you wouldn't get either kind of honey, right? Well, it it depends. I mean, if yeah. you if you leave them with all the polonia honey and you don't harvest any of it, and then you just put more boxes on top and let them harvest all the buckwheat honey, so you have polonia honey in boxes, and then you have buckwheat honey, then yes, you can have both of them. Mm -hmm. or you can extract and harvest both. You know, it's up to you as the beekeeper to decide how much honey you're going to extract and how much you're going to leave for the bees. Right, because they'll be flowering at different times of the year. So you have to be watching that, right? Yeah, they're not Polonia blooms in way. Yeah, Polonia blooms in spring and buckwheat blooms in summer. Right. And then other, other ones in the fall. So you could have potentially multiple different types of honey throughout the year. Amazing. Yes, you, you could bloom, you could plant, um, you could plant uh, goldenrod too. And goldenrod honey is universally disliked by people. Wow. But to keep that's the bees why, alive. Yes, and that's what they eat in the winter. And I'm fine with that as a beekeeper. Right. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. We're right just about out of time. Um, Thank you, Jimmy. That was amazingly informative and there's lots more to think about. And uh, everyone, please watch for a uh, follow-up email with Jimmy's links, um, ideas how to get involved with local beekeepers and some books to read. And we'll also have a recording of this available soon. Thank you, Rita and Andy for this wonderful opportunity. All right. Thanks everyone. Have a good evening. Bye.